This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. At least 11 killed in clashes after the arrest of Mukta Robo in Somalia's Baidoa city. China says cooperation with Africa is about supporting development across the continent. And the UN concerned about deteriorating situation in the Central African Republic. Hello everyone, welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details on those stories in just a moment. But first, Uche Okoronko with the day's business headlines, Uche. Thank you, Beatrice. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Biz. Egyptian traders could now face jail terms and hefty fines for hoarding consumer goods. And the European Central Bank ends its bond buying program. Of course, all that coming up within the program. For now, it's back to you, Beatrice. Uche, thank you. And we begin in Somalia, where at least 11 people have been killed in the country's city of Baidoa after clashes between security forces and supporters of a former Al-Shabaab leader broke out. Mukta Robo, who is seeking election as a regional president, was arrested Thursday. Authorities accuse him of bringing Islamist militants and weapons back to Baidoa, the capital of southwestern region where he's running for president. Now, a founding member of Al-Shabaab, the government's highest ranking defector, and finally a candidate for elected position. Mukta Robo has carried many titles. Ashtatal gives us more. Mukta Robo was one of the Somali government's biggest achievements against Al-Shabaab. A founding member of the militant group, he defected last year. He is part of the Laysan clan, one of the largest in the southwest region of Somalia. He fought in Afghanistan with the Taliban in the early 2000s. He then became a founding member of Al-Shabaab. He acted as a militant group spokesman. In 2017, he defected from the group, making him the highest-ranked Al-Shabaab official to do so. But his standing with the government changed when he announced his plans to run for the presidency of the Southwest state. Clan politics still play a major part in Somalia, and the Laysan clan is one of the largest in the state. For now, his candidacy is uncertain following his arrest with observers worried about the prospect of the upcoming regional elections. Astatal, CGTN. Well, let's broaden this discussion a little bit and get more on this developing story out of Mogadishu. I'm joined by CGTN's Abdulaziz. He's here in studio with us. And CGTN's Girum Chala is joining me from Addis Ababa. To you both, thank you for joining us on Africa Live. Abdulaziz, let's, let me start off with you because 11 people dead there in Baidoa in those clashes. First of all, did Mogadishu anticipate this, uh, this insurgency? Did Mogadishu anticipate whatever happened? Well, Beatrice, you're right. Uh, I don't think the federal government in Mogadishu anticipated that Robo enjoyed such kind of uh, support, especially from the public in the southwest region. His arrest uh, yesterday and uh, the subsequent of the southwest in an election that has been planned for the 19th of September. So Mogadishu definitely did not expect this kind of uh, backlash and violent protests that will that has now entered its second dose. So it's a big uh, setback for the Somali government, especially at a time when there's so much tension between Mogadishu and uh, federal uh, member states who are cut off ties, as we know, with the, the, the federal government in Mogadishu. Right. Girum, there has been an alleged involvement of Ethiopian troops here in this situation, in the arrest as well. What are the authorities saying about this? What do we know? Well, good evening, Beatrice. We have heard from the news as Ethiopian authorities are also saying that Ethiopian troops have involved in the capture arrest of Mukta Robo. But uh, some authorities that we spoke to at the Ethiopian Minister of Foreign Affairs say that uh, the Ethiopian troops have not involved themselves in this arrest. The former Al-Shabaab commander might be maneuvering around Baidoa, where the Ethiopian sector, the western part of Baidoa's sector, was controlled by or is controlled by Ethiopian troops. But Ethiopia 
uh, they say, uh, the authorities say, are saying that Ethiopia is following a different approach when it comes to its uh, relationship with Mogadishu. Since the coming of Abiy Ahmed into power, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Ethiopia is following the non-interference kind of policy towards Somalia. So, all in all, the understanding that we have from Ethiopian authorities is Ethiopian troops have not involved themselves in the arrest of uh, 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 the former commander of Al-Shabaab, Beatrice. Abdulaziz, Amisom troops are also on the spotlight in uh, Somalia. So, how will this development affect uh, future Amisom operations in Somalia? Well, uh, Baidoa itself was a town that was liberated in uh, 2012 by Ethiopian troops who were serving and uh, who were not serving then under Amisom. So they did a good job in pacifying that region, and that's why they remain in that area and towards almost the border with Kenya. So often in uh, its mission that is now entered its 11th year, Amisom, uh, despite playing a pivotal role actually in dislodging Al Shabaab, has found itself. Uh, in uh, con conflict that are regarded as internal conflict in Somali issues. Like, for instance, in this uh, instance where Robo was, was, it's being said that he was arrested by Ethiopian forces, but the Mogadishu government is saying that uh, the Somali government uh, ordered the arrest of uh, the former militant commander. So it's going to uh, have a big setback, especially towards Amisom and especially towards uh, the Ethiopian uh, contingent of Amisom who are being perceived as the ones who did carried out that order. But then one thing to note is uh, Amisom, despite them being working in Somalia, they are under the African Union, but their main responsibility lies with the Somali government. So if the Somali government sees an individual, a former militant commander, as a threat to uh, regional stability, and the way the statement says he amassed a number of armed fighters and brought them back to uh, Baidoa so that he can create instability in the case if he doesn't win that election. So it's going to, the Amisom issue is going to play as a major setback. But one thing also to note is that Amisom will not try to uh, create insecurity. Amisom is the one that created stability and will not want to be seen as a force that creates uh, instability in uh, this area that it once liberated. Right. And Girum, that regional stability had improved in the recent past and we had also seen improved ties diplomatic ties between somalia and ethiopia so how will this exactly impact ties between ethiopia and somalia well to be honest with you beatrice the relationship between somalia and ethiopia ethiopia uh, and, and eritrea and the three countries in general terms has improved as you've said earlier and this incident is a minor issue for the three countries according to ethiopian ministry of foreign affairs uh, officials because the relationship between the three countries is now renewed as you might call it because ethiopia wants to follow a non-interference policy despite the fact that by the way ethiopia has two uh, contingents in in somalia one operating under amisom and one independently operating as abdulaziz was saying earlier and ethiopia wants to change uh, the influence of its troops uh, from one which was interfering if you if you might say it uh, that way to one that can support the somali uh, government it could be in institutional development or you know strengthening the somali troops uh, where they are could be police or the army itself so the relationship between somalia and ethiopia has been renewed they want to do more the ethiopian president has been there the ethiopian uh, uh, prime minister since he was elected was in somalia the three were meeting twice three times so this is a minor issue according to authorities here and the relationship between the three countries especially ethiopia and eritrea will continue in a different path now a positive one, Beatrice. Right. Uh, Abdulaziz, clan politics in Somalia plays a key role, particularly even in election times here. Uh, observers are worried about the impact that this will have on the upcoming regional elections. What will the impact be? Well, you're right. Somalia is based on clan-based politics. There's a system known as 4.5. The four are the majority clans, and 0.5 means the minority clans and they enjoy more than 60 seats in uh, the parliament other than the minority who get half of that number. Now coming back to the elections that are scheduled for 19th of uh, uh, December this month, uh, the election uh, robo is not expected to contend in this election. So clan politics in that area, that area belongs to an, region, uh, an area called uh, Bay, uh, Bay, Bay and Bakol region. A particular community lives there known as Digil and Mirifle. So the position of power will only be shared 
the presidency will be taken by one single subclan from the Digil and Mirifle, and the rest of the position, the cabinet ministers under that regional administration, will be appointed by that president, who will also distribute power according to the clan and subclan basis. So it's quite a controversial issue, even in the regional uh, aspect, even in the general aspect. The president of Somalia, ever since uh, Siad Barre came, uh, was uh, toppled different clans have been exchanging power over and over again so it's not something that one clan can stick to it so clan dynamics is very powerful and it's one that can create instability if the government and if regional authorities don't heed uh, the clan uh, structure system in their regions all right the interesting developments there in somalia's uh, politics uh, abdul aziz Bello joining us here in nairobi and girum chala in addis ababa ethiopia to you both uh, thank you well, let's stay with African politics for the moment. The White House has unveiled a new strategy for engaging Africa. And a key pillar is designed to counter the rising influence of China and Russia on the continent. CGTN White House correspondent Jessica Stone reports. It was just three months ago that Chinese President Xi Jinping announced Beijing would provide $60 billion in financial support to the continent of Africa. That's on top of a similar $60 billion package arranged for the region back in 2015. Over the past decade, China has been building roads and railways across Africa and is investing in the continent's energy projects. U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton calls Beijing's spending a wake-up call to Washington. Africa, he says, is strategically important to the United States. They are deliberately and aggressively targeting their investments in the region to gain a comp competitive advantage over the United States. Bolton says the Trump administration's new Africa strategy will focus on countering the influence of both China and Russia by increasing bilateral trade and investment in African nations, tying it to responsible use and leverage from the White House. This uh, opportunity for a void that has been left there in Africa for a long time. And I think there's an opportunity, at least now America understands, as a better strategy that is purposeful and engaging to Africa. Yet Washington has made one key move towards making it easier for U.S. business dollars to flow to Africa. This fall, Congress passed legislation that combined several agencies into one to invest up to 60 billion U.S. dollars into developing countries, including the acquisition of equity. Experts say incentivizing American companies to lend in Africa serves two purposes, countering terrorism and furthering market access. The last thing you, you want in Africa is you know, a series of failed states in the continent, but also Africa is, is a growing, uh, growing important market for the United States and, and the West. Washington's promise to increase engagement in Africa is complicated. At the very same time that China and Russia say they will send more military troops to the continent, the Pentagon says it's scaling back, promising a 10 percent cut in U.S. military strength in Africa. Jessica Stone, CGTN, Washington. Well, even as the Trump administration advances the new policy expected to strengthen U.S.-Africa ties and counter competition, analysts caution against looking at the African continent as a battleground. Africans shared their thoughts on Twitter on the new policy, and that still carries historical strategy. The approved U.S. policy to be adopted immediately will demand a new vetting of projects that will be cleared for support by the United States. At Karen Attire highlighted this in her tweet. Some of the key areas that were noticeably missing were tweeted by at Vicky Marshall 4. Analysts have warned the administration to move away from a tug of war on Africa. The new policy, however, drags the old strategy that puts America first. Well, China's foreign ministry says the country's cooperation with Africa has always been about helping the continent with its development goals. Ministry spokesperson Lu Kang made the remarks at the regular press briefing in Beijing. China has always thought that cooperation should fully respect Africa's will, meet its needs, and not interfere with its internal affairs, whilst also not attaching any conditions. I want to point out that China's cooperation with Africa is aimed to promote Africa's capacity for independent development. It has helped Africa to develop and has brought benefits to the African people. But the U.S. person, apart from talking about the United States' own needs, wasn't thinking about Africa, but about China and Russia. This is very interesting. 
The International Criminal Court is set to decide on whether to grant former Ivorian President Lohond Bagbo bail. Bagbo's trial for crimes against humanity has lasted seven years. He stands accused of inciting violence in Cote d'Ivoire after refusing to concede the 2010 elections. 3,000 people died in clashes with prosecutors laying partial blame at Bagbo's feet. His lawyers argued the 73-year-old's health is declining in prison and that he would not pose a flight risk. Stay with us here on Africa Live as we still have more news for you on the program. Don't go away. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. We come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. The United Nations has expressed concern over the use of excessive force by security forces against opposition rallies ahead of the general election in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Authorities in Kinshasa have been called upon to ensure the right of freedom of expression and peaceful assembly are fully protected. Tensions are rising ahead of the December 23rd poll. Five opposition supporters were killed earlier in the week as they gathered to welcome rival opposition candidate Martin Fayulu as he campaigned in the southeast. And according to the United Nations, one in every seven people is in need of assistance and protection in the Central African Republic. Director for, for Operations and Advocacy at the UN Humanitarian Office, Rina Gelani, says about half of those requiring humanitarian assistance and protection in the Central Africa are found in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, adding that the humanitarian situation there is one of the world's largest and most complex crises. Gelani says attention given to the Ebola outbreak should not overshadow simultaneous crises facing the DRC, including the largest cholera outbreak in 15 years and increased insecurity in the East. Over the past six months, the humanitarian crisis in Central Africa have not only persisted, but several have grown further. Many of the crises are rooted in ongoing armed conflicts. Strengthening the protection of civilians, a core issue on the Security Council's agenda, is of utmost importance in this region. African states are said to have registered remarkable progress when it comes to allowing citizens or fellow African states to enter their territories with less of no visa requirements. Compared to the 22% access in 2017, Africans do not need a visa to travel to 25% of other African countries this year. Here's CGTN's Girum Chala. Benin made the most progress in opening up its borders to African travelers, moving from 27th place in the 2017 edition to first place in the 2018 report. Zimbabwe also broke into the top 20 with the introduction of a visa on arrival policy for SADC members. Overall, compared to 2017, Africans do not need a visa to travel to 25% percent of other African countries up from 22 percent. To date, 32, 32 member states have signed the protocol while only one member state, Rwanda, has ratified it. It is critical that all member states become parties to this instrument as soon as possible. The protocol on free movement is one of the pillars of the integration process of the continent. As an African, one can get visas on arrival in 24% of other African countries, and one of the newcomers which have opened their doors for fellow Africans is Ethiopia. The country has allowed citizens of AU member states to get visa on arrival at the Disababa Bole International Airport. Ethiopia has started issuing visa on arrival to all citizens of the African Union. 
the Pan-African vision of our founding fathers of a united, integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa at the inception of the, Af the organization of the African Union in 1963 is more than ever sounding at this point in our history. Still, Africans need visas to travel to 51% of other African countries. Many African states blame the rise of security threats and terrorist and criminal elements infiltration not to allow free entry of fellow Africans into their territories. I know that the full implementation of free movement of people requires overcoming numerous challenges. But this cannot and should not stand in the way of our dream. What is required is renewed political will. More than any other group in the world, Africans suffer from the scourge of xenophobia and racism. While we cannot ensure that these injustices will be eliminated any time soon, it is within our power to make, to make Africans feel at home on their own continent. The African Union believes to achieve the bigger and all-rounded African plan of progress that is Agenda 2063, realizing free movement of people as soon as possible is key. For Africa to trade with itself or for better overall people-to-people -people ties in the continent, the success of the plan will be paramount. Group Dara CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. In Poland, efforts to finalize the fine print of the Paris Climate Accord neared a conclusion three years after the landmark agreement. As CGTN's Eshing Rinan reports, negotiators at the UN climate talks have faced the final day with many issues undecided. Just hours before the 12-day talks are set to end, although the goals of the Paris Agreement are ambitious, text is vague in detail and has left some nations wondering if it had any real teeth or whether it favoured rich countries. The UN Climate Change Conference is tasked with finalising the implementation guidelines. The UN Secretary General had a warning for ministers and delegates. Failing here in Katowice would send a disastrous message to those who stand ready to shift to a green economy. So I urge you to find common ground that will allow us to show the world that we are listening, that we care. Developed countries must scale up their contributions to jointly mobilize 100 billion US dollars annually by 2020. China has been a solid supporter of the Accord's principles. Special Representative Xi Jinhua has said China will continue to play a leading role in global efforts. We promise to make the best efforts to hit the carbon emissions peak at around 2030. China is willing to work together with other countries to actively implement the convention and the Paris Agreement. She also introduced China's prominent achievements in combating climate change. He said the share of coal as China's primary energy source dropped from 72% in 2005 to 60% in 2017. The government aims to get it down to 45% by 2030. Last year, China's new energy initiatives accounted for 40% of the global renewable energy capacity, making the country among the world leaders in slashing emissions. 55% of the country's new energy consumption came from clean energy, replacing 750 million tonnes of thermal coal. CSS China also affirms support for South-South cooperation to combat climate change. The country has allocated about $105 million to help developing countries tackle global warming since 2011. Sirenan, CGTN. And as deliberations continue in Poland, many developing nations are concerned about their increased vulnerability to the impact of climate change. In Africa, water shortages, intense storms as well as droughts are putting lives and livelihoods in danger. Climate change poses a challenge for many African countries. But governments are now taking the opportunity to find lasting solutions. The Kenyan government is looking to transform arid and semi-arid areas into the country's breadbasket. 
Drought, though, remains a persistent problem, with a national drought emergency declared in 23 out of 47 counties. The Horn of Africa is currently experiencing one of the worst hunger crises due to prolonged drought. Kenya has also had its fair share of floods, with 800,000 people dying earlier this year. West Africa has also been hit hard by floods. In Nigeria, extended rainfall caused the country's two main rivers, the Niger and the Benu, to burst their banks. Thousands of people were displaced, their farmlands destroyed. More than 100 people lost their lives across 10 states. In Rwanda, heavy rainfalls also had devastating consequences with mudslides, leaving at least 200 dead. A few months later, about 40 people were swept away in more mudslides in neighboring Uganda. All across Africa, natural disasters have claimed the lives of many, making climate change a pressing issue. Scientists gathered at the 2018 COP24 climate talks in Poland highlighted how developing countries are hardest hit by the impacts of climate change. Developed countries pledged around $100 billion to poorer nations to help them deal with the consequences. However, some agencies say they're not delivering. Nigeria's President Buhari stressed that climate change cannot be fought by a single country. Fifteen game-changing initiatives in 14 countries were honored as winners of the United Nations Climate Action Award. However, frameworks such as the Paris Agreement, it seems, are only as good as the willingness of national leaders to keep their word. Asatal, CGTN. Egyptian authorities are furious with a Danish photographer who posted a photograph apparently lying naked with a woman on top of one of the pyramids of Giza. Egypt's parliament summoned the Minister of Antiquities for details about how the event unfolded. Climbing the pyramids is strictly forbidden in Egypt. Here's Adel Mahroui with more. The Great Pyramids of Giza have amazed all its viewers. Its stunning colossal size, however, can make the small instructions banner next to it unnoticed. It says climbing is forbidden. Yet for some visitors, climbing the 140 meters high ancient construction has been an interesting adventure. Recently, a Danish photographer released videos of his trip to the top of the biggest pyramid, Khufu, with a woman. To be very logical and sensible. What happened around the pyramids or above the pyramids? It's not the first time and it's not going to be the last time. I'm sorry to tell you, it's going to happen every now and then, as far as we do not protect what we have. As far as there is weak point in security, there are corruption somewhere, it will happen again. At the end of a three minutes video the photographer released, a woman took off her clothes to appear topless. In another photo shared on the internet, the duo appeared lying together naked. It's not an insult for us. It's just our traditions which does not accept it. So we felt insulted. Furious at the incident, members of parliament summoned the Egyptian Minister of Antiquities. He confirmed that the ongoing investigations are trying to verify the authenticity of the visuals and explain how the events unfolded. The instruction had to be given to our kids, to our people in their education, how to treat their history, their antiquity, and the visitor coming to their country. Every visitor is ready to respect what we write for him, instruction they will do. But in the minute he can find out a way to sneak and to do what he wants, he will do it. So corruption is the key word. Several cases abusing the Egyptian ancient heritage have been previously reported. The pyramids of Giza have been climbed many times before. Some tourists have been permanently banned from visiting Egypt for this incident. The government has been planning a major reform in the pyramids of Giza site. It wants to facilitate access and random wandering around the ancient sites and introduce stronger security measures. Adil Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. 
December 14th marks the 55th anniversary of the establishment of China-Kenya diplomatic relations. Kenya's Ministry of Education has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Chinese Academy of Sciences to support the operation of the China-Africa Joint Research Center. The center, the only one built by the Academy in Africa, is geared towards scientific research and encouraging knowledge transfer between the two countries. Leaders from the Kenyan government and scholars from Kenya and China assembled at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Science and Technology to officially open the Jaikuat Botanical Garden and the Sino-Africa Joint Research Center. The Botanical Garden was set up in collaboration with the Wuhan Botanical Garden of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and it disseminates cultural and scientific information about plants. Sajorek, a collaborative initiative between Jaikuat and the Chinese Academy of Sciences comprises specialist research facilities including laboratories, a herbarium and greenhouses. Sajorek serves as the platform and bridge of scientific cooperation between the Chinese and African scientists in a wide range of fields. It is a hub of Sino-Africa collaboration on biodiversity-related research. It also focuses on areas such as wildlife protection, prevention and treatment of desertification, climate change monitoring and modern agriculture demonstration. It is unremittingly implementing the Bell and Road Initiative proposed by President Xi Jinping and the People's Republic of China for the Belt and Road Regions. The Chinese Academy of Sciences and other partners intend to support Sajorek to launch flagship projects which include developing a modern agriculture research center to address food security, developing a traditional medicine research center to resolve Kenya's public health issues as well as enforcing cooperation in earth sciences. In launching of this center, the Chinese scientists and also Chinese government are sincerely hope our Kenyan brothers and sisters can share with China's experiences for development, uh, can also uh, have the motivation and uh, a momentum to push Big Four agenda through scientific and through science and technology. China's commitment to the project was captured in a memorandum of understanding signed with Kenya's Education Cabinet Secretary Amina Mohammed. Kenya has anchored science, research and innovation at the heart of socio-economic development. This collaboration therefore constitutes a core strand in delivering our nation's priorities. The research center is located on a 40-acre piece of land at the university's main campus. The opening of the project comes as Kenya and China mark 55 years since the establishment of China-Kenya diplomatic relations. The Sino-Africa Joint Research Center is meant to address local sustainable needs, build scientific capacity while strengthening ties between Kenya and China. Wilkisanyabo CGTN in Nairobi, Kenya. Let's now look at news making headlines in business. Here's Uche. Thanks, Beatrice. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Egyptian traders could now face jail terms and hefty fines for hoarding consumer goods. And the European Central Bank ends its bond buying program. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Okay. But beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible? And why? Let's get some reaction. 
action on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sumitra Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. Now let's start off in Egypt. The country's parliament has agreed on new laws which make hoarding essential goods to manipulate prices a, a crime. Now when ratified, offenders risk a jail term of five years or a fine of about 55,000 US dollars for the crime. Since Egypt devalued that pound and removed subsidies on fuel and electricity, unscrupulous unscru uh, traders have been hoarding essential goods to boost uh, profits. Now the new laws are also expected to cur curtail a fuel smuggling, which has been on the rise in the country. Inflation in Egypt has accelerated over recent months, reaching a peak of 17.5% in October, and that's up from about 16% the previous month. Now, the just-concluded con 2018 Africa Forum attracted leaders and businessmen from across the continent to discuss ventures and business opportunities within Africa. Amongst the participants was Abdul Samad Rabiu. He is one of Nigeria's richest men and also the owner of Boa Group. Here's CGTN's Yasser Kim, who sat down with him on the sidelines of the event. I believe we should be doing more of this. It is uh, an important event, you know, quite a number of heads of state and a lot of business executives from, you know, all parts of Africa. And by having this kind of gatherings, you are able to identify issues, problems, and also opportunities, and you can discuss them and see how you can partner and you know develop the continent what are the challenges that faces you uh, when you try to expand in the continent first of all as an african to start with for me as a nigerian it's more difficult for me to even travel to some of these african countries than say an american or a chinese or european or a canadian do you understand what i'm saying so how is it that i cannot travel to say the next country bordering my country, you know, without a visa, but yet somebody from 10,000 kilometers can just fly in and just enter. So we have to address some of those issues. That is one. Number two, we import about 3 million tons of fertilizer every year into Nigeria, coming from all sorts of all parts of the world. And it, you know, have to be imported through the ports. So that means either Lagos, Port Harcourt, Calabar, and then transported to the northern part of Nigeria because that is why we use most of the fertilizer for farming. Yet I'm only 100 kilometers away from an area where there is so much phosphate that can be used with limestone, my limestone that I'm in Sokoto to produce fertilizer, you know, in commercial, you know, quantity. So, but that is not happening because the synergy is not there. What is missing to be able to achieve the dream of a continental free trade area? You know, uh, human capacity, job creation, you know, infrastructure, you know, social development, and also infrastructure. And if we're able to do all of this with the resources that we have in Africa, we'll not be having issues. You know, so we need to work on our infrastructure. It is cheaper transportation-wise. The cost of freight from China to Lagos is cheaper than transporting cement from Lagos to Maiduguri or to Kano or to Sokoto. Believe it, inside, inside Nigeria. Nigeria. Believe it or not. What do you think about the idea of having a continental free trade agreement in Africa uniting all the African economies? The continental free trade agreement is a good thing. However, I must add that we have to be very careful because whilst it is a good idea, and I believe it is a good idea, but it has to be carefully you know, uh, monitored. Those are the kind of things you need. But then the continental free trade agreement means that you have good coming from all these countries. So the reason why I'm saying that we have to monitor that very well, we don't want a situation where goods will be dumped in some of these African countries and then they will be flowing into other countries within Africa <coughs> and be killing some of the African industries. 
And moving on now, the Ethiopia-Djibouti railway that was constructed with the assistance of China has started reducing transport costs from the port of Djibouti to landlocked Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia depends on majority of its exports and its imports from, port, from the port of Djibouti. And this railway is assisting the traders to get their goods to Ethiopia within just a day. Now, the country is planning to set up industries along the railway line to boost its economy. Coletta Wanjoi reports from Addis Ababa. Since January this year, this railway that connects Ethiopia to Djibouti has eased mode of transportation for traders. Cargo trains have a capacity to carry some 3,500 to 4,000 tons of freight, with the Ethiopian government anticipating up to 7 million tons of cargo annually. Uh, that has contributed a lot in, uh, since Ethiopia is a landlocked country. Uh, you know, it used to take like uh, six to seven days to bring goods by trucks from the port of Djibouti, but now uh, it takes only like a day. The United Nations Development Program in Ethiopia has launched a report dubbed Industrialization with a Human Face. It recognizes the critical role that this cross-border railway will have in boosting the manufacturing sector in the country. Ethiopia Djibouti Railway, for example, is important in terms of not only providing the logistic support that is needed in sparring the industrialization, uh, but also in opening up the country. Uh, as more uh, industrial zones uh, are being created. And I think this will have very positive externality uh, in the industrialization process. But beyond just a connection between the two countries, economists say the project is a stimulant for regional growth. The whole idea of the Belt and Road Initiative is to create a connection between all the countries. We'd like to see a railway connection, for example, between Kenya and Ethiopia as well. Another which can go all the way to Egypt. And so in the end, we have connectivity between all the African countries, and this will have um, benefit in terms of advancing regional integration in the continent. The over 700-kilometer railway was constructed with a total investment of $4 billion. The Ethiopian section of the line cost $3.4 billion, 70% of which was provided by China Exim Bank and 30% by the Ethiopian government. The World Bank recognizes China's role in supporting investment in key infrastructure projects like the Ethiopia Djibouti Railway. It says Africa still needs a lot of assistance in order to develop its economy and there is enough room for more finances. Koleta Njohi, CGTN in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Now on the international front, the European Central Bank will withdraw crediting mass bond buying in order to help save the Eurozone from crisis. Now despite the institutions achieve admitting confidence in inflation staying on track, he announced a lower growth forecast and underscored domestic and foreign risks. The scheme has seen the ECB buy about 3 trillion US dollars of government and corporate debt to ward off the threat of a catastrophic deflation. According to the policymakers, the scheme has boosted growth. It's also helped create millions of jobs and set inflation back below 2%. According to the latest ECB forecasts, inflation should dip from about 1.8% this year to 1.6% in 2019. Underlying inflation is expected to increase over the medium term. Supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and rising wage growth. So the overall environment, the overall atmosphere has become one characterized by increased general uncertainty, which takes the shape now and then of different phenomena. And I think this is having, evident, is at least considered by, by the Governing Council one of the reasons, so if not the main reason, for this, uh, for this uh, weaker data. Meanwhile, tech giant Apple is now unveiling plans for a $1 billion campus in Texas that will create jobs outside Silicon Valley. The new campus, located near the tech giant's facility in Austin, accommodates about 5,000 employees with a potential growth of up to 15,000 people. Now, employees will work in fields including engineering, research and finance. Back in January, Apple indicated it will invest about $30 billion in the U.S. over the next five years, as well as create 20,000 new jobs using the overseas profits repatriated at a lowered tax rate. The move comes amidst intense pressure from President Donald Trump to move jobs, especially in manufacturing, to the U.S., with the White House imposing heavy tariffs. We are so thrilled to announce that we'll be opening a new campus here in North Austin. It'll be 133 acres, which is a significant campus, 
Uh, it's just part of a plan that we have to expand across the U.S., but a key part. Uh, we'll start with 5,000 seats in the first phase, and we'll have the ability to expand to 15,000 in total over time. We're also incredibly proud of the diversity we have here in Austin. This campus is one of Apple's most diverse, and the commitment and the embracing of so many different cultures, races, people that have different backgrounds and experiences uh, make us so proud to have an incredible community of people of color, LGBTQ, uh, immigrants, and dreamers here on Apple's campus. Texas will continue to invest in Apple. And one of the best ways that we can do that is we are investing more in our world class universities to make sure Apple will have access to the premier workforce in the entire world. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz, but coming up on Global Business Africa, Africa's trade ministers are in Cairo to review plans of adopting the African continental free trade area. Of course, we'll bring you more on that at the top of the hour. For now, it's back to you, Beatrice. Uche, thank you. And we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. South Africa's renowned Soweto Choir takes its talents to the United States. When you look at Africa, what do you really see? Do you see fast-growing, endless deserts and parched earth? Or do you see the biggest opportunity for an agricultural revolution in a generation? Do you see crowded, unplanned cities or vast, untapped markets? Do you see a population at risk? Or do you see a billion-strong opportunity to grow the next wave of multi-billion dollar firms in Africa? When you look at Africa, what do you really see? Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. South Africa's renowned Soweto Choir has taken its talents to the United States. The choir is in America as part of a 50-day tour. Let's take a look. The Soweto Gospel Choir has crossed over the Atlantic and is electrifying America with their talent. The choir is currently touring the U.S. with their new album, Freedom a tribute to the late Nelson Mandela. As always, they're trying to show a more diverse side of Africa. And that's what we're trying to, 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 to tell the world that Africa is not all about poverty, but Africa is all about positiveness and being, and being the best. The group has already received two Grammys and collaborated with top artists like Celine Dion. But now, they're looking to add a special new dimension to their music. I would definitely would like to, you know, in, in, include, you know, Chinese kind of music, because it will, be, it will be something very new to us, and we, we would like that challenge, definitely. The group is currently on an international 50-day tour, giving the world a chance to listen to some sweet South African tunes. Asa Tal, CGTN. Southern China's Guangdong province continues to set the pace for cities of the future. Once known exclusively for manufacturing, areas like Huizhou are integrating technology, ecology and innovation to advance economic development. CGTN's Lindim Tongana visited Tonghu town in Huizhou to see the latest and greatest from Guangdong's Silicon Valley. Guangdong's largest freshwater wetland provides a unique ecological backdrop to the province's new smart city. Tonghu SciTech Town. It's the flagship project of the Huizhou Ecological Smart Zone. And what better way to explore it than by hopping on board one of its unmanned cars. From big data to artificial intelligence, Tonghu Tech Town is well on its way to becoming a world-class gathering place for innovative high-tech industries. Guangdong's Silicon Valley is already home to domestic and foreign high-tech firms, including Fortune 500 giant Cisco Systems. 
Once completed, this eight square kilometer multi-purpose ecological landscape will have office parks, schools, hospitals, hotels and shopping malls. An all-in-one solution for work and play. But how does all this smart city tech come together? In this town, all the air conditioners, electrical appliances, streetlights and cameras, all these terminal devices connect to our data center via sensors. It's then managed and run through professional software, and the data is passed on to our smart cities management control center. That's what you see on the big screen. Huizhou's economy has always thrived on manufacturing, but this bold move towards high-end technology will change the city's future development. The building of Tonghu SciTech Town is positioned to drive the transformation of Huizhou, to contribute to a more complete and diverse economy that includes research and development and design. And the economic potential goes beyond Huizhou. Tonghu Tech Town feeds into China's national plans for the development of the Pearl River Delta and the Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau Greater Bay Area. We're just beginning to explore the possibilities of smart eco-cities, and we hope that the development of Tonghu Tech Town will become a reference for China's future city construction. Tonghu Tech Town is a model for urban design and development. And though we may not know what tomorrow holds, one thing is clear. The future of China's cities is bright, smart and green. Lindim Tongana, CGTN, Huizhou, Guangdong Province. And your sports news now coming up next. Here's what's ahead.